הנושא הבא שאנחנו נשמח לשמוע, פרופסור שטפן הויזר מאוניברסיטת דרמשטאט, ידבר על שני צדדים של הבושה והבחינה האתית שלה. בבקשה. Good morning. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Rabbi Shaftai, dear Dr. Valfa, Dr. Rashi, dear representatives of the Tactical Command College, dear students and representatives of this university, uh, please let me express my, my gratitude to be granted the opportunity to listen and to talk to you. And thank you very much for inviting me and for setting up this great conference and for your hospitality and kindness. Let me start with a short story that goes back to my early 20s. A couple of years after Germany was reunited in 1990, at that time I was involved in an international student exchange program. Around Easter time, my family was welcoming two Jewish exchange students from South Africa, Matthew and Selvin. Well before his journey to Germany, Selvin wrote and asked, whether we had Matzot in Germany. Matzot, yeah. Otherwise, he would find himself unable to come. He would only eat unleavened bread during Passover. And I remember when we opened Selvin's letter, there were like big question marks above my father's head. Matzen, my father asked, where the heck can I buy Matzen? Maybe I can bake it, my mother said. And my brother said, no, it will not be kosher then. I know that you must be a kosher baker. I am a kosher baker, my mother said, uh, referring to the colloquial meaning of kosher in German, which kind of translates like trustworthy. Nobody denies that you're a trustworthy baker, my father calmed her. But we cannot bake kosher bread in the religious sense of it. We must buy it, but I don't just know where. In the middle of our despair, my grandmother came along and said, you need matzen? Well, I've got a whole kitchen unit full of it. I eat it every morning. It's good for you. It had never occurred to the rest of the family that my grandma regularly bought matzot at a special supermarket. And having that settled, we wrote to Selvin and he would come. But when he arrived and uh, we opened his large suitcase, get what was in it. It was full of matzot, of course. A whole suitcase full of matzot, and he hardly brought any socks or underwear or anything. Just matzot. During Matthew and Selvin's stay, we once drove to Weimar in Eastern Germany to visit the town of Goethe and Schiller of German Enlightenment and Humanism. A great place to be and something to be proud of, but we knew that Buchenwald concentration camp was just some miles away from Weimar, and none of us had ever been there. So we asked Matthew and Selvin whether they wanted to see it, and they said yes. Buchenwald was a labor camp in which between 1938 and 45, some 250,000 people of various nationalities were incarcerated, many of them Jews. One estimate places the number of deaths at 56,000. While visiting Buchenwald with Matthew and Selvin and witnessing the documentary of crimes and horror, I wished that the ground would open up and swallow me. I could hardly look into the eyes of my Jewish friends, and when we left the campsite and sat down at the Buchenwald Memorial to rest, I was completely speechless and just sat and stared. We were sitting there in silence for a while until Selvin started to dig in his bag, fetched a piece of matzen. He broke it and offered some to Matthew and to me. We sat there and ate in silence. After the second matzen, I felt that I could face my Jewish friends again. And after the third matzen, I recovered my ability to speak. <laughs> so I share this personal shame story with you because I think that this story witnesses to two, two different shades of shame that we need to distinguish when trying to explore this abysmal emotion ethically. Of course, shame can have many different faces. Shame is everywhere. But it's not easy to recognize, because shame is something that people hide, for they are ashamed of being ashamed. This is why shame has been called the Cinderella of the unpleasant emotions. It is left to the eyes of the expert, like Jacob Stein, to discover shame at work in an individual life and in a society. 
The US American theologian James Fowler said about shame, I quote, now that I have eyes for it, I can see it everywhere. Shame can be a pathological emotion that leads to destructive formations of the human soul, where an excess of shame experiences can no longer be processed and integrated into the self. Shame can and very likely will be replaced by aggression. Permanent shaming can lead to chronic prophylactic aggression in order to protect oneself from being shamed. These defense mechanisms have been called the masks of shame. Masks behind which this emotion hides itself, among them violence, contempt, arrogance, coolness, conformity, protection, blaming, addictive behavior, including violence against oneself, or again shaming, which may establish a vicious circle of being shamed and dumping shame on others. This pathological shame has destructive effects on oneself and on interpersonal encounters. However, I, le I will leave the analysis of pathological forms of shame to experts in the field of psychology like, like Jakob, who's just talked to us, and I will try to identify only two shades of shame that touch upon my field of expertise, which is ethics, and which can be found in my personal shame story. If you feel ashamed, just like I felt ashamed at Buchenwald concentration camp, together with Selvin and Matthew, or as some of us have felt uh, ashamed after Justice Zwietal yesterday talked about us, about, about concentration camps, it remains unclear in how far shame correlates to ethics at all. You may feel ashamed, just like me, and turn completely silent because you bear witness to something to which you cannot respond but with shame and silence. So when we set out to, so when we set out to explore into that kind of shame, we first need to listen to that silence. But I also want to find out what may follow from that shame for the victims, for yourself, for the people you encounter now. If ethics is essentially about good works, which I believe it is, are there any good works that correlate to shame? In my case, I just felt silent. I had looked into an abyss of the human being that filled me with shame. And this was not only a shame of being German, a collective shame, as Jakob Stein has just described for us. It was also a shame about being human. It was a shame about being a member of a species that can be as cruel and as vulnerable as in Buchenwald concentration camp. I will call this shame radical shame. And I will explain what I mean by that in a second. But let me already indicate that neither apology nor excuse or reparation can answer adequately to radical shame because these are related to guilt. There is nothing we can do when feeling ashamed for being human. Seemingly, there is no passage or transition from radical shame into ethics. The only adequate response to radical shame, in my eyes, is to call for redemption. But there is a formative value in that shame, a way to address each other in the face of shame, a way of naming the silence, a practice that witnesses to the impossibility of human responses to radical shame. I will call it compensatory ethics. This is what Selvin and Matthew did when they shared their matzen with me. For their sake, we could also call it kind of matzen ethics. Sharing Madsen signified that Selvin and Matthew recognized me as a part of a common story that we share. Maybe also a short story in which we are waiting together for redemption to come. I don't know. And while doing so, the best thing to do was to share Madsen. By now I have commented on pathological shame, and to which therapy correlates. On radical shame, to which I think redemption correlates, and to a kind of compensatory ethics that responds to this abysmal shame by revealing that it is impossible to negotiate its reasons. There are, of course, more shades of shame that keep turning lighter the more distant they appear from their origin in the human condition. But it is important to keep in mind that they all bear the signature of radical shame, although ethics may find ways to respond to lighter shades of shame. In this talk, I would like to mention only one of these lighter shades of shame and call it subjective shame. Its ethical correlate as to ethical tradition is awe or reverence. 
But let us begin to listen to the silence of radical shame, and that means that we need to begin at the end. In, this, in his posthumously published novel, The Trial, Franz Kafka tells the story of a man, Joseph K., who gets charged for an unspecified crime by an anonymous authority. The novel tells Kay's permanent struggle to deal with this charge, with guilt, and with vain attempts to find justice. At the end of the novel, Kay is taken by two gentlemen to a quarry, where they settle Kay's head down on the top of a stone. <coughs> the two pass a butcher's knife back and forth between them, with Kay knowing precisely that it would be his duty before the authorities to thrust, thrust the knife into himself. But he does not take the knife. Kafka concludes his novel as follows, I quote, But the hands of one of the gentlemen were laid on Kay's throat, while the other pushed the knife deep into his heart and twisted it there twice. As his eyesight failed, Kay saw the two gentlemen, cheek by cheek, close in front of his face, watching the result. Like a dog, he said, it was as if the shame of it should outlive him. It was as if the shame of it should outlive him. If anyone ever depicted the abyss of shame and its persistence against any attempts to handle it, Kafka has. As psychology tells us, shame is not primarily related to actions, but to persons who act. Where guilt says, I have made a mistake, shame says, I am a mistake. Guilt is related to what you've done, shame to who you are. Yet Kafka deepens this psychological understanding of shame. In Kafka's account, shame transcends the individual life and relates to the way human beings exist. They exist as beings who are not what they pretend to be. And if they realize where they stand, they could not handle this ethically, because if they were to give up pretending, they had to give up on themselves. Joseph K. feels ashamed at the very moment when he's completely in the hands of his murderers. They kill him for no reason, as if he were being, as if he were a being that could be killed that way, like a dog. What daunts him is the fact that he is indeed such a being. The vague rest of his self-esteem is revealed as something that visibly falls short of the truth of his existence, which is meaningless to others and completely subject to their whims. Kay is ashamed of the discrepancy between his self-esteem and the real value of his self in the eyes of others. In everyday life, shame is usually arising when your actions visibly fall short of the impression that you like to generate of yourself. In the limit situation of Kafka's novel, Joseph K. is not ashamed of something that he lacks or falls short of, but of something that he has, namely his self-esteem, which turns out to be vain. He simply, he simply could not despise himself, even when he was taken to the slaughter. So he essentially was ashamed of being human. And this shame of being human, Kafka says, survives individual existence. Kafka's novel is a parable. It confronts us with an insight into the way that human beings are. Kay's shame goes on because it is our shame, the shame of those to whom it is revealed that they hold their existence in esteem without any other reason than because it is human to relate to yourself. It is therefore a shame that sticks to one's existence as a member of humankind. It's a shame about being human. This shame about being human defies any ethical response. It does not call for ethics or therapy. It calls for nothing human beings may achieve, I think. It corresponds, however, either to seceding from the human race or for the redemption of humankind, which of course is nowhere to be found in Kafka's world. This radical shame arises from the revelation that human beings are not who they pretend to be. They are not masters of their own life, even to the point of being ashamed when they are convicted of esteem for their naked existence. This objective humiliation of the way to exist as a human being has been practiced millionfold in the Holocaust. From there, radical shame travels through time and reaches us today. Descriptions 
of radical shame can be found in the real-life testimonies of those who survived the Nazi death camps, such as Primo Levi, or as Justice Zwital yesterday, who changed from being a judge to becoming a witness when he was talking about Treblinka and other death camps. Such testimonies witness to a crack in humankind that makes those who are not cynical about humanity ashamed for being human. And they reveal to us how thin the cover is with which we clothe our moral nakedness. The witness of the Holocaust reveal the abyss over which we build our normalcy, the normalcy from which we draw our positive self-esteem. And they have also brought home to us how quickly this relation to ourselves gives way to mere self-assertion. The death camps, the testimonies to the death camps, grip us with a dawning comprehension that we may essentially not be who we thought we'd be. Primo Levi describes this shame when in the beginning of the reawakening, he tells us about the first four Russian soldiers who arrived at Auschwitz concentration camp. I quote, when they reached the barbed wire, they stopped to look, exchanging a few timid words and throwing strangely embarrassed glances at the sprawling bodies, at the battered huts, and at us few still alive. They did not greet us, nor did they smile. They seemed oppressed not only by compassion, but by a confused restraint which sealed their lips and bound their eyes to the funereal scene. It was that shame we knew so well, the shame that drowned us after the selections, and every time we had to watch or submit to some outrage. The shame the Germans did not know, that the just man experiences at another man's crime, at the fact that such a crime should exist, that it should have been introduced irrevocably into the world of things that exist, and that his will for good should have proved too weak or null and should not have availed in defense." Unquote. The emotion of shame here not only arises from morally wrong actions, otherwise we needed to call it guilt, but from witnessing to the fact that human beings like us are capable of acting and suffering this way. The death camp revealed to these Russian soldiers that they erred about humanity insofar as they held fast to the thought that such humiliation of human beings by human beings was impossible. The Italian, the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben has pointed this out in commenting on Robert and Talmud's The Human Race. And Talmud describes how a young man on the death march from Buchenwald to Dachau flashes when an SS man selects him to be shot for no reason as the SS used to do on this march. Commenting on this flash of the young man when he realizes that he is about to be arbitrarily shot Agamben says, I quote, Shame is not a feeling of guilt or shame having survived another, but rather has a different, darker, and more difficult cause. It is as if he, the young man, were ashamed for having to die, for having been haphazardly chosen, he and no one else to be killed. The student is not ashamed for having survived. On the contrary, what survives him is shame. Unquote. This young man is grasped by shame when he realizes that he is randomly selected to die on account of his naked assistance, not even to die at the place of someone else. He's selected for no other reason than just for being there. His flush may indicate that he feels ashamed for having thought that there should have been a reason for him to die, or that someone other should have actually died in his place. In any case, he can no longer hide his self-relation as someone who holds himself worthy of living. This flesh reveals that he cannot give up his self-esteem, that his murderer renders objectively meaningless. And this aspect touches upon the Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas' analysis of shame in his early work on escape, de l'évasion. For Levinas, shame arises when we cannot evade the visibility of something about ourselves that we would like to hide, or from which we should, would like to distance ourselves. And again, this is not an understanding of shame as a psychological state, but as an emotion intrinsically tied to the human condition. 
According to Levinas, shame about nudity, for example, is paradigmatic for the central aspect of shame as it results from the impossibility of hiding the nakedness of one's physical existence. Levinas writes, quote, Shame arises each time we are unable to make others forget our basic nudity. It is related to everything we would like to hide and that we cannot bury or cover up. What appears in shame is thus precisely the fact of being riveted to oneself, the radical impossibility of fleeing oneself, to hide from oneself, the unalterably binding presence of the eye to itself. Nakedness is shameful when it is the sheer visibility of our being, of its ultimate intimacy. And the nakedness of our body is not that of a material thing, antithesis of spirit, but the nakedness of our total being in all its fullness and solidity, of its most brutal expression of which we could not fail to take note. It is therefore our intimacy, that is, our presence to ourselves, that is shameful. What shame discovers is the being who uncovers himself." Unquote. For Levinas, shame results from the impossibility to escape from ourselves, to appear as mere physical bodies, and to hide our subjectivity. Levinas here stresses the protective role of shame, oh sorry, uh, although we can reflect on our bodies as if they were material objects, we do not appear to others merely as objects, but as subjects. We appear immediately as ourselves as beings who are related to themselves. This is why shame, why we need shame to safeguard our appearance as beings whose relation to themselves is revealed. Shame stimulates to cover our subjectivity from becoming exposed alongside our physical appearance. And it tries to protect our bodies as places where our reflexivity and self-relation express themselves. So Levinas here stresses the protective role of shame for subjectivity, which has been widely discussed in psychology. Shame is an emotion which can regulate the encounter with the other human being as a person. And that means as someone with inwardness, with reflexivity, with self-relation, as someone who presents and protects himself in a social role without which he would never dare to encounter me. In short, shame regulates the encounter of beings who, unlike animals, lost their immediacy and gained awareness of themselves and it helps to protect these cells in their vulnerability. We cannot hide our presence to ourselves, and we are therefore standing naked in our subjectivity before others. Probably those of you who are, who are army members uh, know that there are a lot of shaming rituals. In, in any army in the world. The uh, German army is kind of a sissy army in comparison to the Israeli army, but uh, I can tell you that there are a lot of nice shaming rituals uh, attributed or connected to, to nakedness. And you probably all know uh, that there are um, possible possibility sources of shame in your, your army as well. You know. We cannot hide our presence to ourselves. This is the basic function of this kind of shame that arises from nakedness. So we are standing naked in our subjectivity before the others. We cannot hide that we are aware of our nakedness. But nakedness can be covered. Ethics can in a way respond to subjective shame. But there are ways to deal with shame that preserve its protective and regulative function. And uh, Jakob Stein has told us about this, uh, or has alluded to these this ways uh, in his talk before. But to say that to say that shame regulates encounters so that people do not mutually hurt each other remains somewhat awkward. Because the problem of ethics with shame remains that shame will not let itself be steered, particularly when its regulatory function and personal encounters is at stake. We can to some extent train the ethical response to shame, the attitude of awe or of reverence, but this will only amount to a fragile cultivation of an attitude, not to change the human being. Early Greek philosophy even took shame as starting point for ethics, well before the virtues became the center of ethical reflection. But shame remains an emotion, a priori, to moral reflection. 
something that moves people to behave and treat others with awe and that they can only influence to a certain extent. So shame and its moral appearance as awe are endowed to human beings by nature, while modern ethics tries to base morality on reason. Shame can be manipulated, can also be instrumentalized for ethics, it can also be integrated into one's own life, but it cannot replace moral judgment. Shame therefore gives a hard time to the rationalistic ethics of modernity, since it does not concern the maxims that we follow, but the persons who we are. Unlike actions, shame cannot be morally wrong. One cannot have a wrong emotion, but one can be mistaken in evaluating the issue to which the emotion is related. When somebody says, shame on you, this is not to be taken as a request to feel ashamed, but quite the opposite. It is a reminder that others would feel ashamed to be the person who has done what he did. So shame on you means something different than saying you should regret that. Because it does not evaluate the moral value of an action, but the lack of shame of a person who has done something morally wrong. It is hence not only shame as an emotion deeply related to the human condition, that hinders ethics to respond to it, but it is also modern ethics itself that tends to exclude emotions like shame from moral judgment. So the question remains, is there a passage from shame into ethics? Is there a step we can take to handle shame? Given that radical shame, the shame about being human, pervades all other shades of shame, we are inclined to follow Kafka, Primo Levi, Levinas and the Gamben saying, shame arises from an abyss in humankind to which ethics cannot respond. You cannot pull yourself out of a mire by your own hair, while guilt can be forgiven, if at all. Shame cannot be. Neither you nor others can ex-shame yourself without giving up your giving up or destroying or destroying what is an intrinsic part of the human condition namely to relate to oneself. <coughs> Somebody can repent his actions that have done harm to others, and those who suffered can or may be able to forgive him, but nobody can take the shame of him that he is somebody who would do what he did. Ethics can, however, bear witness to the abyss. Our actions can respond to the crack of humankind, to the estrangement, nakedness, pretense, and to the illusions about oneself as well as to cynicism, cruelty, and to reckless self-assertion. Actions can be placed over the abyss and be made transparent for the darkness that lurks beneath. And they can be made transparent for the necessity of redemption as a divine response to the reasons of shame. At least our actions can bear witness to a redemption of humankind, although that may eventually never arrive. There still is no regular passage from shame of being human to ethics. Rather, I think we need to escape into ethics. When might this be the case? And I conclude with this. There is a need of ethics when my shame affects the other. When the other shame affects me to the extent that shame poses the question whether we belong together and share a common story as human beings. <coughs> Shame individualizes and it empties the space between I and though. Ethics may contribute to establishing or affirming the I between I and though. When loneliness and silence become unbearable, it is about time to step and to escape into ethics and convey to the other that the source of all good has not yet dried up. Here ethics amounts to compensation for a redemption that it is still to come. The ethical response to shame is a compensatory ethics that reveals that it is impossible to negotiate the reasons of shame and to overcome the human condition. This ethics can only be a poor reminder of what shame actually calls for, but which human beings cannot bring about. In its answers to shame, ethics can only cover an abyss, an abyss that seems nonetheless inevitable to be covered. So let us at the end return to the beginning and to my personal shame story with Selwyn and Matthew at the Buchenwald Memorial. By breaking Matzen and sharing it with me, Selwyn and Matthew built a bridge between them and me 
through which the abyss would still shine. To step on this bridge would mean to share a hope, obey a hope that does not rest on human possibilities. Compensatory ethics therefore means not to set up a framework for working on radical shame and its reasons, but to step into the void, to witness practically to the impossibility of redeeming, and to find practices of waiting together patiently for the Redeemer to come. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.